Okay, um, I think there's quite a few of you, so I will probably get st started. Um, again, um, thanks for coming. Uh, my name is Karthik. I am an AI engineer. I live in Singapore. And um, my, my job on a day-to-day -day basis is to um, sort of lead projects that are catered towards industry challenges. Um, that can be in the areas of uh, finance, in uh, uh, language processing, uh, in security, in healthcare, which is a key interest of mine. Um, I also did my uh, Master of Engineering with the Biomedical Engineering Department at uh, NUS, that's in Singapore. Um, and my research was based um, quite a bit around um, the use of AI for um, histopathology, which is a, a sort of subfield in medical imaging. Um, and histopathology is where we uh, segment tissue from, uh, you know, places where doctors do cancer resections and stuff like that in order to understand what the components of the diseases are. Um, I didn't have a lot to show about my research previously until I think just two days ago, um, you know, we uh, it was actually just pu published. So if you're interested in the work that I was doing, this was about three years of work. Uh, I'm just going to put the link in the chat. So so that's the um, uh, the sort of work that I did for my masters and stuff. Uh, not the most pleasant of experiences, but definitely I think something worth um, you know something that really taught me a lot about the way AI works and, and how we use it properly and uh, what its applications are in medicine. So, um, of course, coming from, uh, you know, uh, with my domain expertise in, in histopathology, you'll find that a lot of the, maybe the examples that I give are heavily based around microscopic imaging. Um, that doesn't mean, of course, that these uh, techniques can't be adapted to other forms of imaging, whether it's X-ray, CT, MRI. Um, and uh, if you're interested in those techniques, I think there are some other uh, Science Circle members who are working on, uh, on uh, I think, uh, some of these discussions. I think Sumo previously presented uh, on magnetic resonance imaging. Uh, MRI imaging. So that's used to study, for example, uh, diseases in the brain, um, to study neurological function, um, things like that. And there's a lot of applications for AI in that sector. Um, okay, so the thing about me is, uh, whenever I do these presentations, uh, I... Uh, Paul, that's because your voice isn't on. <laughs> oh, oops. What's the point of me saying that if you... Okay, um, so so the thing about me is, uh, a as an AI engineer, I often find that I revisit the fundamentals a lot. And so everything that I learn about what I do in the field um, actually brings me back to some fundamental topic that I learned. Um, and I and these presentations, I typically try to structure them so that we can go from something simple to something more complex. And I am experimenting with this and I'm trying to use it to also, you know, ensure that I have my grounds well established. And so in order for us to do that, I think it's very important for us to try and look at a very simple example and to figure out how um, AI is applied from there and then derive it to something like the field of computer vision. Um, so, so this uh, example is something that I presented in a previous lecture. It's called Deep Learning. If it feels like a repeat, um, I apologize. Uh, I just hope it adds some value to what was presented before. So uh, l let's talk about uh, this concept of a neural network. So a neural network is based on the method, as, you know, the, um, the functionalities in your brain. What, make, what helps you sort of make your decisions. 
And these architectures are built to draw on mathematical properties of uh, data to draw relationships to then build a sort of classification. So this example for you, you know, um, let's talk about um, predicting the probability of buying a house. So we have a house, we want to know what are the chances this house is going to get uh, purchased. And so then there are two um, factors that we have to, let's say there are a few factors that we have to consider. Two of them could very well be, um, one, the number of rooms, right? We, we typically, if you, you want to buy a house, if you have more bedrooms or something like that, maybe we take away price from the equation. That could be something that makes the house more attractive. Uh, the distance to the bus interchange, nobody really likes to, to you know, travel and that sort of stuff. So in that case, uh, these two factors could very well influence the probability that the house is going to be get bought, its attractiveness. Um, now, a neural network sort of correlates these variables by multiplying uh, things called weights. Um, and so these weights sort of talk about the contribution of each variable to an outcome. So uh, x1, the distance from the bus stop, multiplied by weight number one that is added to x2, the number of rooms multiplied by weight number two, that's a guess of course, the weights. Um, and that sum is added to a bias. Bias, just think of it as something that is used to normalize those variables and that's used to determine the probability that someone is going to buy a house. Um, now, of course, this doesn't mean anything if the network isn't trained. So the network needs some examples. Maybe we did a survey and then we showed a few people, okay, this house, um, the distance from the bus interchange is uh, 200 uh, meters. Uh, for another one, it's 100 meters. One has three rooms, another has four rooms. So, so what's the probability that you buy a house? Do you want to buy the house or not? So if it's a no, it's a zero. If they do want to buy a house, it's a one. So that's our ground truth information, annotated information. Now, what the network is going to do, of course, it's going to make a guess the first time about what the weights are. It's going to randomize those variables. Um, it will add a bias to normalize the values. Uh, and then what it will do is it will pass that into a function f. Um, and that function is called the activation function. So this activation function sort of determines a probability between 0 and 1, the output of the network. Whether or not something is true or false, going to get bought or not, what's the probability? And that gets compared against the ground truth information. So if they find that through these examples and these inputs of x1 and x2, the network got the variables wrong, right? it got the output wrong, it's going to calculate an error. This error is also called a loss, and that loss is going to be used to update the variables, the w1 and w2. So in that sense, what the network is actually doing is learning a bunch of features that contributes to an, a final outcome. So it's trying to relate data and it's trying to make those relationships to come up with an outcome. Uh, imagine this, uh, just this segment of predicting whether or not the house is going to get bought. That could be a very small part of a bigger problem. So whether or not the house is attractive could very well determine whether or not the house is going to appear in something like a magazine. And so um, these are how sort of neural network architectures work. They sort of apply some multiplications to some variables and then they come up with an outcome. Um, and just to continue explaining the architectures, the input layer is where these variables go. The output layer is where the prediction comes from. The hidden layer could be anything that we sort of program. So the thing about a neural network is it has no semantic idea about the properties involved. It doesn't know what a house is. It doesn't know what distance from a, uh, from a train station is or a bus interchange is. It doesn't know what the number of rooms are. You as a human have an understanding of those variables. But to a computer, everything is literally just mathematics and statistics. And so it's really trying to make guesses and then it's updating that on the mathematical properties, uh, the error the you know the the factors and the variables and then it tries to make a guess about how the data is really related to each other uh the the data uh components are related to each other rather um of course the structure of a neural network architecture is something that we define that's not something that computers have the capability of understanding on their own. That's, of course, still up to the programmer. So there is some human intervention involved at this stage. 
Now, in the field of computer vision, of course, data isn't really one dimensional. You're not going to have, um, you know, a, a single dimension or rows of data. What you have is a two dimensional um, set. It could be three D, but you know, we'll just we'll just keep it simple for now, and we'll talk about you know individual pixels in an image. If we look really, really, really close into an image, um, of course, we can see these pixels, and we can see. Um, we can sort of understand what sort of values they, they contain or encompass. So in an RGB image, you would have three different values for one pixel, a red, a green, and a blue value. Now we can call these red, green, and blue channels. So these are one of the, um, the things we refer to. Um, this is one of the terms we use when we describe a color image. We break it down into different channels. Of course, um, if you, you've used a printer before, um, you don't necessarily see RGB. You see cyan, magenta, yellow, and black. So, so there are different color representations. Of course, in computer vision, mostly it's just red, green, and blue. Now, there are grayscale representations as well. These are very simple representations. The typical values that we these range from in computer vision is to 0 to 255. 0 to 255 because that's the range you can't distinguish with your human eye. So if you looked at that color bar, the reason why it doesn't look grainy, it looks very smooth, right, from 0 to 255, is because the human eye can't distinguish color differences between those values at that level of precision. Of course, there's UINT8, uh, 16, 32 bits. Um, those are a bit large for our computers to process, so um, we won't really talk about those. Um, and so uh, let's talk about the diagnosing of an image. Now, if we think about it, if we just studied the individual colors, if we broke an image down into its individual components, the red, green, and blue, that tells us some level of a story about the image. So it tells us how many red pixels there are, how many green pixels there are, and what's the intensity of those pixel pixels in the range of the, you know, in, in the context of the image itself. Now, the power of that, of course, is we can use that to determine some property regarding the image. We can actually use that for image classification. Uh, for example, let me just move away. Uh, let's talk about differentiating cancer and non-cancer. So let's say a surgeon takes a tissue sample. Um, he's trying to remove a tu tumor from a patient's body. And that sample is then passed uh, for microscopic evaluation. Now, if it's not cancer, it's going to look a bit like the image on the top left. There are not many cells in the tissue. If it's cancer, it's going to look like the tissue that's just next to that, the one that says tumor core. Tumor core because it's taken from the, the central part of the tumor. Now, the concentration of cells is so much higher that the image looks a lot darker. So if we studied the grayscale representation, that effectively tells us that this is a tumor. The problem is healthy tissue can also look very cellular by virtue of things like reactivity. Reactivity meaning the way the brain responds to a disturbance. If you get an injury, it's a very high chance that your cells will reproduce to um, sort of make up for the loss of neurological function. Uh, brain, cells in the part of the cerebellum, which is a part of your brain as well, um, these also look quite granular and so the concentration is quite high. So it's not enough for us to use colors alone to make that sort of classification. What we need, of course, is morphology. Morphology meaning shape. And that's done through this mathematical operation called a convolution. So in a convolution, a filter that is maybe 3x3 three three in size or 5x5 five five pixels in size is passed over the image for us to get a new representation of the image. Um, I typically use this for engineering um, you know, students, but I don't think it really matters. What, it really, what really matters is what are the effect of these convolutions on the image. So let's talk about the image of a zebra and an image of a horse. We want to differentiate these two images. Uh, I'm going to convert them to grayscale just to make it easier for us to visualize. I am saying that I want to do, of course, um, the I want to do a classification. I want to do a comparison. And when I apply this filter, this filter is called a Sobel Edge Detection Filter. The resulting images look a bit like this. So you can see the edges in the zebras, uh, you know, lining the fur, the surface. All these things are really highlighted a lot more than they are with the horse because those features are not so distinctly represented. 
And that alone allows us to make the diagnosis. We've essentially identified some morphological and shape aspect of the image or some textural aspect of the image, and then we then made that classification. So in computer vision, if we think about it, that use of a filter, a two by two image, a two by two feature map, to, to sort of uh, uh, derive some feature about the image, some feature regarding the image. It's almost the same as uh, multiplying a weight to a variable to understand some outcome, as we did with the house, of course. And so these filters, that, that three by three filter, those sets of numbers, that's something that the computer can, of course, guess as well to determine some feature regarding the image, to understand the textural, the edge, the shape components of the image. And that's how neural network works. Uh, when we talk about computer vision in the field of uh, self-driving cars, for example, you know, these are the base, the base principles that allow those networks to detect objects in the field. And so um, a neural network is essentially an expansion of those steps. A neural network tries to identify the filters. A CNN, a convolutional neural network, tries to identify those filters. It tries to guess those filters. It makes some sort of diagnosis, some sort of classification in the image. And then it goes back, it updates the layers, and then it tries to train itself to better extract features from the images in order to better make a classification. Um, the power of this technique is, you know, as we do these convolutions and as we update the weights based on the error, the trained neural network is able to do this. The lines and the dots and the textures, all these components are going to translate into high-level features within the image. What do I mean by this? These lines, these dots, and these edges will eventually tell us about the existence of things like wheels, things like wings, things like a sail, things like a nose, a ear, an eye, a fin, uh, you know. Um, and so, so what they essentially allow the network to do is to identify salient features within the images that people can use to make a classification. And that just comes from mathematical operations that extracts these low-level features, the lines, the dots, and the edges. And that's the power of the mathematics that goes on in computer vision systems. Um, and how do we improve on those systems? How do we uh, apply the, these systems uh, when we have you know, very little data to train on? Sometimes it, it's a problem with a data set being small that doesn't allow us to extract these features easily. And one of the biggest problems in medical imaging is, is because of the policies that are involved in getting data sets. It's very hard for us to get enough data to produce these features, to train a model um, for it to identify and extract these features. And so in that case, we sort of apply certain techniques. We cheat the model into thinking images are different by applying something called augmentation. And augmentation simply means using the same image but a different representation of the image to extract more features. We can adjust, for example, the orientation of the image. We can flip it in the horizontal axis or the vertical axis. We can adjust the contrast in the image, the color of the image. And so let's say a cameraman is moving closer towards an object when he takes a photo. You know, we can apply uh, an augmentation to train the model you know, with an artificially enabled zoom in order for the model to learn those features that are important towards identifying this object, this parrot. Um, in the context of medical imaging, in microscopy especially, um, different labs that produce these microscopic images, when they apply stains, chemical treatments, sometimes even the temperature of the room that the lab operates in, that could be different from day to day or an hour to hour, it can cause the image, uh, you know, its contrast or its color features to change. Uh, and, and in order for us to account for that, sometimes what we can apply to that image is, a, is an artificial color augmentation. And so this forces the model to not learn from just the color representation of the image, to pick up the shape components, to pick up the shape representations, the textural features that allow it to make a diagnosis. Let's say we want to improve the model further and we don't have enough images. One method for us to deal with that and one method that's really popular in medical imaging is this concept of transfer learning. 
So transfer learning is where we apply and we learn representations from another image uh, or other uh, another data set of images. Let's say you're looking at uh, clouds, right? We like to say we sometimes what we like to do is when we look at clouds in the sky, we like to think that oh, I see an elephant in the sky, I see a tiger in the sky, I see a cat in the sky, some representation that we've learned, something that we have in memory. We use it to make an association between another object that we see. Transfer learning essentially works the same way. A network learns on a multitude of images. It could be anything from cats versus dogs versus cows um, to, to you know, know, distinguishing classes of vehicles per se. And these public data sets are available in massive amounts on you know, the, 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 the internet. And what we can do is we can train models on those data sets. And we can then apply the weights, the lines, the dots, the textures, and all these features that it's learned from those images. And we can apply them to other problems. And this is especially useful in medical imaging. Because when we don't have that large data set, we can then apply these learned features and we can use them to diagnose medical images. And so this is a powerful and commonly used techniques, uh, technique in AI. And these networks that have been trained, you know, some of, some of us, we don't really have a large GPU at home. We don't have multiple GPUs at home, uh, a graphic processing units. We don't have powerful computers to train these models on maybe 14 million images. But what we can do is we can use models that were trained by companies like Google or Facebook, um, MetaDesis, of course. And these models that were trained on those large data sets, the models that have learned features, those lines, those dots, those check textures, they are also available on the public interfaces, you know, public websites, uh, on GitHub repositories. And so that's the powerful thing and what I really love about the deep learning community. You know, a lot of AI researchers actually publish their models uh, publicly for many people to use them in their projects. It doesn't really it doesn't really matter whether or not it's a commercial or non-commercial project. These models that were trained by Google and Meta, they're available for anyone to use. And so the accessibility of AI is really fantastic. And that accessibility has actually allowed for, you know, image analysis in the medical domain to really flourish. Um, a lot of models that were produced for different areas like gastric biopsies, uh, brain uh, pathology analysis, you know, MRI imaging, they were based on these models built by Meta and Facebook. Maybe they were adapted in some way or another, but essentially the principle is the same. It's there to learn and then fine tune on new data. One example of a network that's used, it doesn't really have to be used for classification, of course. It can be used to derive a new representation of the image. The idea is we feed the inputs of uh, data that could be, uh, again, in the one-dimensional one space, we could be talking about uh, the, the price of a house, the uh, number of rooms, of course, the distance from the train station and stuff. Uh, the output feature is not really a classification. The output is the same data. Uh, the goal is, of course, to make uh, to derive a smaller representation of the image. For those of you who work uh, in mathematics, you are familiar. You are probably familiar with the concept of uh, PCA, Principal Component Analysis. It's where we try and take the data from a high dimensional, uh, you know, feature space to a smaller dimensional feature space, and then try to reproduce the data such that we get a, a minute representation, a representation that takes the most important features of the data set. Uh, if you don't understand this, that's okay, because what's really important is where this is used or where this is useful. By learning a smaller representation of the image, we actually derive the most important features of the image. Now we can choose to then decode the information to provide a new representation. And how is this representation derived? It's derived from our annotation. So let's say I have an X-ray image, or I have a few X-ray images. I basically draw a mask manually for some of the, uh, the X-ray images in order to identify the lungs within the image. And then I pass that to the model and I say that, okay, for this particular X-ray image, I want this output, this representation. 
what the model will do is it will learn to derive the important features from the image to then decode these features to provide that representation. How does it learn that? It's based on the error. The first few times, it's of course making a guess. The next few times, it's of course updating the weights to fine tune itself in order to fit itself to your data to make sure that those representations are learned accurately. And the usefulness of this, uh, you know, in multiple domains is that we can use those representations to understand some underlying diagnosis. In COVID-19, this, this was really popular, uh, this sort of research regarding segmentation of the lungs, because it helped us understand whether or not a patient with COVID-19, whether or not his lungs are expanded or they, you know, uh, contracted. Is there some sort of pneumonia property regarding the lungs? Is there a risk? And so this was really popular research at that point of time. Uh, in, the, in my area of interest in brain, brain tumor analysis, the segmentation of the tumor for resections to remove the tumor accurately is something that is heavily discussed. Why is it important in the case of the brain? If you don't delineate the boundaries of the tumor, if you don't identify the location of the tumor before surgery correctly, if the doctor takes too much of the tumor away from the central part of the, you know, the, de the detected tumor, if he, if he takes too much, if he cuts too much of the tissue, what's going to happen is the patient is going to lose neurological function. The patient might either go blind you know, they may lose some hearing, they may lose some motor skills. And so that's the danger of not identifying the location of these tumors well enough. And so segmentation allows us to artificially identify the boundaries of the tumor with so much precision, you know, with the ability to understand features mathematically that pathologists are not able to identify because they're not able to look at the pixels themselves closely enough. Um, by being able to do that diagnosis, by being able to do that segmentation, people are able to better identify resection margins for tumors. They're able to identify the locations that they should cut and remove the tumor to make sure that it doesn't come back again after the patient has undergone surgery and to make sure that the healthy tissue in the brain is not accidentally removed. One other area of learning that's really interesting for these images is, of course, the use of uh, self-supervised learning. A self-supervised learning is uh, a technique that's used, again, when there's not enough data to train these models. If you think about an X-ray image, or, you know, on the left is an, is an image of the eye. I think that's probably for OCT, uh, Optical Coherence Tomography. Now, these images, like the X-ray images particularly, there's a certain orientation that's correct, right? You only stand, uh, you have an upright posture for the patient. So any tilting of the image is actually somewhat wrong. What we can do is we can artificially augment the image by rotating it and then tell the model to predict the rotation. How much is this, ro this image actually rotated from its original ground truth? And when the model does these predictions, it gets certain variables, it gets certain errors, and those errors are used to update the weights. Just by doing that, you know, we've not introduced any classification, any annotation from the clinicians whatsoever, but just by rotating the image and then telling the model that the image is wrong, tell me what's wrong with the image, you make a guess, and then it gets an output, and then I tell it, oh, okay, you got this wrong, you need to update your weights in order to fit the data. The model is capable of identifying and learning some important parts of the image. So by rotating X-ray images, the model is capable of learning features that are salient to X-ray images. An X-ray image is supposed to have these features in this location, per se. And these models can then be used for classification tasks later on because they've already learned some features, features some textures, some low-level representations that can be adapted to tasks in the future. Um, another really important use of uh, AI is generative AI. ChatGPT is a form of generative AI. Um, what do you call it? Uh, stable diffusion is a form of generative AI. There is an input. The model is trying to generate a fake image. Um, when this was done early on, the models that were used for this were called GANs, Generative Adversarial Networks. Um, Yes, exactly. Uh, 
actively communicating with, with each other and self-correcting e each other is a perfect example of the way again works. Basically, you have a generator. A generator is taking some data, some random data, noise, and then it's applying some sort of multiplication, some mathematical multipli multiplication, in order to try and generate a fake image of something, in this case, the picture of a dog. Then you have this network called a discriminator. The discriminator sees this fake image. The discriminator also sees a real-world image. And its objective is to try and d determine whether or not the image is real or fake. So these two networks are essentially playing a game with each other. They're trying to distinguish. One is trying to distinguish whether or not the image is fake. Another is trying to generate an image in order to trick the other model into thinking that it's real. And these networks are then updated based on whether or not they got the outcome correct or wrong, whether or not the generator was able to trick the discriminator, yes or no. So by playing a sort of game with each other and by sort of improving with these outputs, the models are able to get stronger at their individual tasks. But the most important thing is that the generator that's output by this model is capable of generating fake images, you know, fake features. And that's sort of the idea that's used, you know, in, in cre the creation of models like stable diffusion. One really interesting use for this that can be applied to the medical imaging do domain is this idea of style transfer. So style transfer essentially uses GANs to take a real image and then to apply some sort of augmentation to make it look like another image in another style. Let's say you wanted to see how your real world picture, your photograph looks like in the eyes of Van Gogh, right? So you would take a number of pictures uh, that you've taken a number of your own photographs, you would have scans of maybe Van Gogh's pieces, right? That captures his distinct artistic style. And you could train a model to apply that style to your images. Some of the simplest examples of these are you have pictures of zebras you want to show, you want them to appear like horses instead. So you apply a style transfer to make them look like horses. And the powerful representations that these models learn can then be applied in the medical imaging domain. Previously, we had to have matched images, which means, let's say you wanted to apply a style transfer from a zebra to a horse. Your training images would have to consist of zebras and horses in the same position, the same orientation, so that the model can learn these representations by performing some sort of matching. But now with advancements and new models, it's possible to do that with, you know, uh, images of zebras and horses in any positions. So you could have three zebras in one image, one horse in another image. You could have two horses in one image, three zebras in another image. They could be standing at different locations. The model is still capable of learning representations of zebras to pass that style onto images of horses. The area in this where this is interesting, of course, is, of course, uh, microscopic imaging, again, my domain. Uh, in, for these samples that are being used, by the way, uh, when they're taken during surgery, maybe to give the surgeon an idea of whether or not he's cutting tumor on a healthy tish, tissue. The samples are taken during surgery, they're brought to the lab, and then they're stained. But to provide a very quick output, they are frozen. And when they're frozen, what happens is ice crystals start to form. So these are not samples that go into the archive. They're samples that are used during surgery, they're thrown away. The samples that are st stained for archival analysis, you know, for pathologists to look at maybe the next day or something like that, they, they use a specific method of paraffin embedding in order to preserve the quality of the samples to see these images. So, for example, uh, if you look at the top left uh, section, right, the, the four pictures on the top left, the one at the top left and the extreme left, those are the images that are frozen. The one just next to that, that's the quality of an image that is unfrozen. And you can see that the ice crystals have almost destroyed the image to such an extent that it's so hard for a pathologist to make a diagnosis for that image. So what if we could learn a style from the images that are stained, that are paraffin embedded and preserved with such quality that it's so easy to make a diagnosis? What if it's possible to artificially transfer that quality to the frozen sections? 
so that we could train models to learn the quality from these separate images in order to apply a style transfer on future images. And that's the power of style transfer in the medical imaging domain. Um, this is one example of something that I tried personally for my, for my master's thesis. You can see that style transfer essentially allows us to perform uh, augmentation of the images in a way that we weren't able to before. The one on the left, the example on the left, that's the Machenko normalization, which is the, the standard method, you know, the typical method that you use. And all that does is provide a color transfer. But if we look on the right, we can actually see if you zoom in, you can see that the sharpness of those individual nuclei, those individual cells has actually improved to such an extent that it's easier to diagnose it. It's easier to look at this image. It's easier to see the important features regarding the image. And this was done with AI. Another area that this can be used, of course, is uh, in new medical imaging, uh, optical bioimaging, rather. So right now, the traditional method, of course, is to take a biopsy. It's to cut a piece of tissue from the patient and to then provide a stain and then to analyze it with a microscope. But clinicians today uh, are exploring even more techniques using advanced laser systems, for example, in order to get these images to study the chemical markup of the tissue. One example is uh, simulated Raman spectroscopy. So that's about using two lasers, two laser beams with different timings. You, you direct these laser beams on the tissue, you get the light the light that's reproduced, and that tells you about the chemical composition of the tissue, the lipids, the proteins. And these images actually look a bit like those images that are produced using staining. The problem is they don't look exactly like them enough for it to be, you know, diagnosed. It's not something that the clinician who works in the pathology department is used to seeing. So what if we could make their jobs easier? That's where we can use style transfer. We learn features from the, from the images that are stained, and then we pass that style of staining, that, that appearance of the staining, onto an optical bioimaging uh, output. So that's another popular uh, imaging domain, and that's where one, you know, that's where the future of medical imaging lies at the moment. Another area, of course, is uh, the anal uh, you know, analyzing the genetic markup of images. So that what we use for that is uh, immunostaining. So we, we apply a stain that sort of identifies the genetic properties of the tissue. Uh, in this case, it's KI67. That's one gene that's used in tumor analysis for the brain. So if that gene is very high in a particular area, that stain will show up brown. Uh, and so one area that we can do is we can identify the morph morphological properties in another stain, a simpler stain, because these stains are actually quite expensive. A KI67 stain is not cheap. Uh, and there are many genes because of the heterogeneity in tu tumors. You know, you could have many genes in many places. So one thing that people are studying is whether or not they can identify just the shape properties in the cells and whether or not that correlates to some genetic property in the tissue. In that case, you only have to use a hematoxylin and eosin stain, a H and E stain, and that's quite cheap. So another area of style transfer that's being explored is that correlation, the correlation between the genetic properties and the shape properties observed in the tissue. Um, this is one really uh, advanced area of imaging, and this is where imaging is going, computer vision is going. So uh, the example that I like to use for this is actually a bit um, localized. What do I mean by that? Uh, I, I basically used an example um, that, that's quite prevalent in Singapore. Uh, in Singapore, when, when kids are at the age of 12, they go for their primary school leaving examinations. And during those examinations, if they're taking English, uh, one of the exercises that they have to do, you have your comprehension, of course, you have your essay writing, uh, that's part of the exam. Another part of the exam is uh, an oral examination. So during the oral, oral examination, they're basically given a picture like this, and they're asked to then talk about the picture to the examiner. Just talk. So their eyes go across the image, they study the different things that are going on in the image, 
and they then explain to the examiner that this is what's going on. I think this is why that's happening. I noticed that this is happening. And then they put, they form those insights. Their ability to communi communicate um, is then assessed for that examination. And one of the things that people have been asking is whether or not computer vision models are capable of, capable of doing that. Because this image is not something that you can study as a whole. There are very di various activities, very different things occurring in different parts of the image. And is the model able to identify these parts of the image very importantly uh, in its individual patches, for example? And the other question that's asked is whether or not a model is capable of understanding the meaning of these things uh, or their relationships per se. And that, that actually brings us to natural, natural language processing, uh, a part of AI, a domain of AI that's heavily in influencing computer vision. Uh, your chat GPT makes use of this quite a lot. This idea was introduced quite recently in the past five years. It's called a transformer. And it's based on this idea called attention. So attention, attention tells us how different elements of a piece of data is correlated. That data could be a sequence of letters, a you know, a sentence, for example. So, so in this case, hi, I am a short sentence. That's a sentence, uh, a sequence of tokens, rather. Each token being hi, I am a short sentence, so on. That that then that then forms a numerical representation that's that's processed by the model. Now, could we understand whether or not these tokens are related to these other these components of the sentence, the words? For example, if we look at um, the words in the bottom right hand corner, a plain banks, a grassy bank, the Bank of England, they are the same word, the same tokens, but they mean various, very different things in the context that they are used in, right? A plain banks refers to uh, the context of aircraft. Uh, an aircraft, an airplane, you know, uh, it could be related to an airport. Uh, uh, the Bank of England, that's a, that's a finance, financial context, right? So could we map these contexts and understand the, the, the use of the words in the sentence? By understanding that, it's very much possible for us to do things like classification or prediction. We could predict the next word in the se sequence. What's the next sentence that should follow after hi, I am a short sentence? Maybe it's something like nice to meet you, right? And that's essentially what ChatGPT is doing. You take your input sentence, the stuff that you put in, ChatGPT draws these relationships. It understands the context of the words through a transformer, through the concept of attention. It actually understands through attention the important words in your paragraph, it learns to ignore the unnecessary stuff, and it provides a prediction output. That prediction output to you looks like a very nicely response, a very nice response to your question. It looks like an answer, but it's actually predicting the next sentence. What does the user want from this input? That can also be applied to images. If we think about this feature space where we draw relationships with each other, it's very much possible for us to put in images and correlate them to these words as well, right? A picture of an aeroplane could very much go into the top right-hand corner, you know, for that image below. A picture of a bank could go into that finance group. So a transformer actually allows us to do this. What it does is it takes that image and it breaks it down into individual patches and it processes, processes them just as you would for a sentence. So it's actually treating an image like a sentence, like a story. Uh, the image is, the, the paper for this is actually called uh, an image is worth 16 by 16 words. Um, it's actually a very powerful paper. It was introduced to, to, to to sort of treat images like sequences, like sentences. Um, and this vision transformer paper, the, the citation is below if you want to take a look later. It actually projects these images, it understands the relationships between them. But of course, the way the model is trained, again, is dependent on some sort of output. So was this image an image of a bird? Was it an image of a ball? Was it an image of a car? By updating the class, by predicting the class, it's able to understand the relationships, the, math the mathematical weights that it should apply to the data in order to perform these associations. 
And the usefulness of this in the context of medical imaging has to do with the use of attention. Attention allows the computer to pay attention to or, or rather to look closely and ignore areas of the image that are not really relevant to the classification. Um, in the case of a golden retriever, the one with the golden retriever, for example, the picture of the dog is actually really a really small part of the image. It's actually peeking up from under the, you know, from the car. So if you look at that image very closely, you know, the car, the seats, all those features are things that you don't want to pay attention to. All you care about is the dog. And if we want to make that classification, the rest of the stuff in the image could get in the way of the model understanding the output. And because of that, we apply attention and attention helps us understand um, what's not important in the image and helps us focus on the important features for classification. In the area of imaging, there are, you know, whenever you talk to a clinician, they will, al they will always tell you there are certain parts of the image that I, see, I ignore, I'm not really interested in. Because these parts of the image will confound my, by, by my diagnosis. They will confuse me. Right? By looking at these parts of the image, like muscle tissue, like white space, like cells, maybe there's an ink, ink stain on the image. You know, Maybe there's an artifact, something like a scratch that was done during surgery that I'm not interested in. And we can actually train transformer models to ignore those parts of the image. Just as we can train transformer models to ignore parts of a sentence that we aren't interested in, that don't mean anything at all to the context and the meaning of that sentence. But one level up, and this is where medical imaging is going in the future. One level up, the outputs from different transformer models. Remember how I said we could put a picture of a bank uh, and into a feature space that talks about things like uh, finance, bank uh, uh, interest, right? We, we could perform that mapping. If we took a picture of a plane, we could correlate it to picture to, to words like airport, right? And and so that that embedding that feature space allows us to do a lot with medical images. That this previous annotation, you know, um, where pathologists actually draw draw lines around an image to indicate where a tumor is, that's not really natural for clinicians. It's more natural for them to write about the diagnosis. What did I see in the images? Um, I saw this uh, cancer. The cells look very concentrated. It's a very simple, ex simple example. Of course, the examples of the diagnosis are written uh, are on the top left-hand corner of the images. But that association allows us to then train models that are capable of outputting this, these diagnoses. That means if I put an image inside, I'm capable of giving a text representation of the diagnosis a sentence that explains what the diagnosis is. One example that th this is being used in, of course, is radiological imaging. And in radi radiological imaging, it's really remarkable that a model is capable of learning um, text diagnosis, and it's capable of then looking at new images and providing a text output of a diagnosis. So this is a really, really, really interesting example of where image, image captioning, that's what this is called, where image captioning is being used in medical imaging. This same correlation allows us to take different images from different modalities, MRI, CT, histopathology, to put them together and perform a more holistic diagnosis of diseases. And that understanding of diseases, that development of that understanding, will definitely help us in improving diagnosis for patients. And I think that... Yeah, from that base understanding of where neural networks come from, that mathematical representation of images, the mathematical um, manipulation of images, of data, in order for us to get a diagnosis, and the learning of those multiplications, those variables, those weights that contribute to some feature representation of images, of text. You know, those things are really powerful in not just helping us perform things like diagnosis in the medical imaging domain. It's also helpful for us to obtain a numerical representation and understanding of disease. You know, what, are the, what is the heterogeneity of the disease? How does this gene correlate to a patient's chance of getting cancer? How does this gene help us understand whether or not this drug 
uh, is going to be useful for the patient in reducing the tumor size. By doing these correlations, I think medical imaging really has a chance to influence the development of um, drugs in disease or treatments like radiotherapy. Um, in customized diagnosis for patients, for example. And I really think that AI as a statistic, as a really just a powerful mathematical statistical method is capable of helping us in the medical imaging domain improve outcomes for patients. And so that's really all the all there is to it. That's that's why I'm interested in it. And I hope that this presentation has sort of give, given you an insight into what these techniques are, where they're useful, where they're going, and what are sort of the considerations involved. Um, yeah, and that's that. Um, thank you very much.